Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, it is a true pleasure to um, welcome David Roy, uh, a researcher from Center for Ecology and Hydrology in the UK, to A3. Uh, David's been with uh, CEH for almost 25 years and is the head of the UK Biological Re uh, Record, Record Center. Um, he ha his work spans a, a large number of high impact themes, including urban ecology, uh, gen genetically modified crops, climate change, invasive species, and ecosystem services. Um, he, his main area, though, is environmental monitoring and assessment, with particular expertise in citizen science approaches. Uh, to that end, David has led several national programs in the UK on citizen science in the area of biodiversity monitoring. He's authored over 130 journal publications and almost 40 books, and several published book chapters and published reports. Welcome, David. Look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. and. Uh, uh, thanks everybody for coming to hear me speak today. So yeah, I'm David Roy from uh, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in the UK. Um, and I'm here, um, I've been here at a conference on butterfly biology that was held in um, NCBS over the last few days. Um, so a lot of my research work has been on butterflies. So uh, this was a good opportunity for me to come to India. It's my first time in India and I'm enjoying it very much. And um, I think I'd heard lots of good things about ATRI from my colleagues within CEH who are collaborating on projects um, on um, uh, floods and water quantity issues, on disease um, modeling and um, work on lakes and water quality. So there's lots of good collaborations already with ATRI. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here and have the opportunity to speak to you. And what I'm going to talk about today is um, some different bits of work from CEH that I am um, have some expertise and experience in, and that's biodiversity um, issues and how citizen science data has helped us to understand um, some of these issues such as climate change and biological invasions and, and um, pollution through pesticides. So what, I want, what I'm going to do in the next 30-odd uh, 30, 30 minutes, 35-40 minutes, is um, give a brief Introduction to CEH. For some of you, may not be familiar with um, the organisation I work for, CEH, and then um, give a brief introduction to the to the group that I currently head, which is the Biological Record Centre, um, and how we how we support citizen science in the UK. And then I'm going to use the last part of my talk to focus on some case studies. Um, of some of the science that we've been able to do by having citizen science data in the UK. So um, this is quite a, a boring slide and you may have seen something similar I think when Lawrence Carvalho came to speak to you, but just so you know um, what organisation CEH is. So we're illustrated down here at the bottom. So we're, we're a research centre um, concerned with the uh, terrestrial and freshwater environment and we're part of an organization called the Natural Environment Research Council, that's sort of our parent body. And we sit alongside other um, centers of, of the NERC um, research, um, uh, research Council. So there's others concerned with the Antarctic, geology, oceanography, earth observation, and atmospheric issues. And NERC itself is one of uh, a broader set of uh, research councils that deal with particular areas. So NERC is concerned with um, the natural environment, um, but there's also other research councils for medicine, engineering, etc. And we we sit within at the, the high level of departments. So we're a government organisation um, at the moment, and we sit under. Um, this is slightly changed in terms of the names, but um, a part of government that's concerned with business energy and, in, and industrial strategy innovation. So a lot, of, and actually all the research, university research funding in the UK also sits under this body. So the university research and the research councils all sit under this, uh, this body. And then there are other departments which are concerned with DEFRA is our department for the environment, farming and rural affairs. So it's um, sort of how agriculture affects the environment. 
and there's other bodies like that. So we're, we're a government organization, so we receive direct funding from sort of core funding direct from government, which is around 50, 40 to 50% of our income. And then we also um, undertake research projects for a whole range of um, other funders, um, the European Commission, other government departments in the UK, some international work through um, international funding opportunities, for example. And we're based at four centres through the, throughout the UK. So uh, Lawrence Carvalho, who's been here to speak, is based at our Edinburgh site. You may know Gwyn, Gwyn Rees and Beth Purse, who have some work with Atree, who, who are both based at our largest site, which is uh, Wallingford, which is near, uh, near Oxford, not too far from London, and that's where I'm based. And then we also have um, another site in the north of England, in Lancaster, and one site in Wales. Up, so we're around, I think around 300, about 250 to 300 research scientists um, and around 100 PhDs are associated with CEH. So um, we're very active as a research organization. Um, we tend to focus on research questions that have um, an applied use, so real, real life problems in the environment. And the way we organize our science is around um, particular themes so um, I guess Gwyn, Gwyn Reese's work around water resources sits under that science area, so he's ahead of that science area. I work within the biodiversity, mainly within the biodiversity science area. The CH is a very integrated organization, so there's lots of projects which work across um, these, these scientific themes. But what I'm really here to talk to you about today is um, the role of citizen science in delivering some of this research. And it's most actively used in the, in the biodiversity area within CEH, where it's got a relatively long tradition of being a way to capture data on um, wildlife species. But the term citizen science is really a, a quite a modern, uh, a recent term. Um, and a lot of the work we've been doing in this area is actually been going for uh, many, many decades and wasn't really um, labeled as citizen science. So the group I had is called the Biological Re Record Center. So it really thinks of what it's doing is biological recording, which perhaps sound is not such an exciting uh, phrase as citizen science, but that's what a lot of the participants think they're doing. They're recording biology. But citizen science has also got lots of related terms, uh, such as Crowdsourcing is a way of delivering citizen science. Um, it can be collaborative um, between people voluntarily providing their time and scientists. And there's a, under here, there's a whole range of projects that are um, types of citizen science. And I just picked out a few examples that I, I knew were happening in India. So to make it a, a bit more um, familiar with some things you may be I'm familiar with within citizen science. There are um, activities developing and um, it was really nice to hear at um, NCBS some of the um, work that's being done on butterflies and moths, for example, um, and also working with Atri in terms of building up some of these communities to contribute wildlife observations. Just sort of growing field, um, uh, so it, there's been some activity in the UK for quite a while, but it's, it's it's definitely expanding and growing in terms of its remit, and that seems to be happening internationally. So what we did, um, and it's, it's summarized in a, in a paper in, um, published in, in PLOS last year, and alongside it is a, is a report that I've left a copy with here for anybody who wants to, to look into it in more detail, is we, uh, we, we wanted to try and understand the range of citizen science projects and see whether there were particular types of projects, whether we could cluster them in the types of way that, that citizen science projects worked. So uh, Michael Pocock and, and colleagues um, working with the Natural History Museum in London and CEH uh, undertook a quite a substantial review of um, around, I think it was around uh, 500 citizen science projects that were operating within the environment um, not just biodiversity related, but say water quality, air quality projects, and scored all those projects as, as how they were, um, how those projects were running in terms of um, when they were established, how many people were involved, 
um, what sort of support they gave to people and how they reported back the results, um, and a whole range of features, around 30 odd categories of information. And that was put together into um, a uh, multivariate statistical um, technique um, to try and identify whether there are any clusters, types of projects that, that could be um, brought out of this. Um, but what we found is, if you're familiar with these sort of plots, this is actually a big cloud of points. There's no clear clusters of groups of projects. So I think that what we concluded from that is that citizen science is very diverse. There's no single one type of project. There's a whole range of ways of doing this um, for, for particular reasons. But what we could identify is, is two major sort of ways of separating um, the types of projects. So we recognize there were a range of projects which were very simple in what they were asking people to do versus those that were quite elaborate. So they had very quite complex things they were asking for people to take part in. And the other major thing that separated out projects was um, those which we sort of termed scientific sampling where the projects were aimed at very targeted sets of people who were maybe already very interested and very engaged in, in the questions versus projects which were deliberately trying to be very mass participation, had lots of publicity, were trying to meet to bring in the general public. And although we couldn't identify clear groups in this work, we, we, we did identify, as illustrated by this um, animation, is that in terms of when projects tend to be set up, some of the earlier projects seem to be very relatively simple in terms of what they were asking people to do and um, were aimed at particular audiences. And there seems to have been some evolution going on that um, now projects have, off, have now ended up, modern projects have tended to be aiming at wider participation. Um, and I think a lot of this has been facilitated by um, technology, basically internet, allowing it being much easier to run these sorts of projects on a big scale now through the use of websites and mobile apps. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that was all I was going to say about this project. But uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's published, it's summarized in this paper. And I guess you, actually the, the other point I want to make about this is in terms of, um, I guess the reason why, one of the reasons why citizen science is is, is becoming more popular and it's aiming at mass participation is that as well as enabling us to do different sorts of science on a large scale and um, potentially over the long term, another benefit of citizen science is it can engage um, the general public in raising awareness of environmental issues. So that's seen as a, another positive benefit. As well as delivering data that's useful, it, it involves people in collecting the data and therefore more interested in some of the issues. Um, so that's the sort of an overview of citizen science and I'm going to sort of focus on the, the biodiversity um, types of citizen science and I, I head up the Biological Record Centre and we, we celebrated our 50th anniversary um, a couple of years ago so we produced a, a booklet which described some of our activities over that period and again I've left a copy here at Atree um, and that 50th anniversary was um, came about from the formation of the Biological Record Centre shortly after the publication of a, a major um, mapping exercise of all the plants in Britain and Ireland, an atlas of the British and Irish flora. But that itself built upon lots of activity of interest in um, documenting wildlife that was happening, happening much more informally um, in the UK through um, these are sort of historic texts for particular areas. This is Hertfordshire, Berwick on Tweed. So these are sort of regions within the UK. Um, and this activity is involved really in terms of there was a major resurvey in 2002. And now a lot of this activity for us also happens online in terms of websites to support these communities. So Although citizen science is seen as a modern phenomenon, there's been a lot of activity in collecting wildlife observations over a long period. And this just illustrates, so in common with um, uh, many places in the world in terms of capturing this data, we have sites to collect this data and we use mobile apps. And this just illustrates that you know, benefit of having 
these sort of systems is you can have a more live tracking of the collection of data. You can visualize it in new ways. Um, and this figure also illustrates that we're collecting wildlife observations across um, biota. Um, we, don't, we don't tend to capture as, so much bird data because that's handled by um, the British Trust for Ornithology in the UK. But we tend to cover most of the other groups um, in terms of biota. Um, and I think a key feature of what we do is we, we try and um, support uh, as much biodiversity as we can, that people are willing to collect and capture information on. So this tree of life illustrates the, the range of the biota of, for which we have some activity of um, working with partner organizations to capture data. So a number of coleoptera um, groups and diptera groups, which are quite diverse. Some familiar groups such as birds, amphibians um, and mammals, for example, plants, um, other invertebrates, etc. And the circles illustrate where we've, we've then published a formal atlas of those, the status of those groups. And the double circles is where we've managed to repeat that atlas, so we've got a measure of change over time. And this is delivered through, we can't deliver all this on our own because we're, we're a relatively small uh, group of um, researchers within CEH. The way we can deliver all this is by working with partner organizations that we call schemes and societies that are independent charities or special interest groups or groups of researchers who are interested in a particular taxon group. So there's a group who coordinate the spider in people interested in spiders or mollusks or plants, etc. And they're often, well, they range hugely in being um, quite large organizations that are independent charities or effectively just one or two people who are trying to promote the interest in a particular group. But we try to pro provide support to those individuals to enable them to um, uh, promote themselves through newsletters or websites. And also we help them with the data and help bring it into a standard databases and um, help check the quality. Um, so this whole area involves lots of people. And when we think of citizen science, we're who are involved in this capture of biological records data, the contribution from volunteers also varies a lot in terms of what people are providing. So at the simple level, it may just be the citizen science are members of the general public submitting an observation of a a species of interest to them that they found within their um, within their garden or in their homes, for example. Those are a bit more committed and record regularly to go to um, record wildlife. Those that do quite systematic repeating of um, sampling. We also have a lot of input from people who are checking the quality of records, coordinating activity within regions. Um, in voluntarily writing identification guides and keys and you know, publishing things in, in wildlife journals, for example. And I know this is true also within India. I've had lots of examples of this um, coordination effort going on uh, within India. But so citizen, science vary, citizen scientists vary a lot in the amount of contribution they provide to these schemes. And it represents a huge amount of input from lots of people who are incredibly skilled and incredibly dedicated in in their interest in wildlife. So that's, that's, a, that's a, I hope, an overview of how we provide support to this biodiversity monitoring by citizen science within the UK. And now I want to give some illustrations really of how we've used this data and why, you know, why do we get support from CEH um, and funding from government to um, collect this data. So I think the, the reasons are that uh, it's well recognized that Species and ecosystems are under uh, many threats um, by many pressures um, through, the, through man, um, anthropogenic pressures. But uh, in recognition of that, those making decisions, um, policy makers, setting objectives for how we, how we manage resource, natural resources, they need clearly good evidence to help protect what's important where there are negative impacts to, to sort of minimize, uh, mitigate those impacts, and accept that we have got 
limited resource in terms of land available for uh, growing crops, um, building homes, um, giving places for wildlife. So it's how to um, effectively make decisions about um, how to, to use natural resources. But uh, in common with everywhere, I think it's, it's very hard to get mon mon money for long-term monitoring. Um, those budgets are generally decreasing um, within the UK. So biological recording as a form of citizen science is seen as one of those potential options for collecting large-scale data over long terms. And can be, you know, when it works, can be very cost-effective. It's, it's clearly not without cost. It needs um, some input to coordinate activities and provide feedback, but can be very cost effective. So I'm now going to, and so to illustrate where it's been of most value or where it's um, clearly demonstrated research output, I'm going to focus on some climate change issues, um, non-native species, and issues to do with pollinating insects and, and pesticides. So just to illustrate overall that we we have had success or uh, us working with other groups have had success in using this data to to provide some quite important messages about um, biodiversity loss and the causes of change in biodiversity loss the first example i want to give um is is reasonably familiar i think in, in those who are looking at climate change impacts on biodiversity um, in terms of range changes what we've seen is through the long-term collection of data, um, as illustrated by this butterfly species in the UK, the common butterfly, in, in a first survey period where um, we published a, an, a, a an atlas of the distribution of all butterflies in the UK, this species was found um, sort of uh, through, through much of England and much of Wales. And then in the later survey period, where we know we knew there was, we could believe the gaps in the earlier period. These orange dots indicate where the species was seen in the second period, but not known from the previous period. So we've seen uh, a massive um, increase in the range of this species over um, sort of a 20-year period, um, and modelling work has linked this to the warming climate that this butterfly has benefited by moving north and colonizing um, Scotland and Ireland um, during the process. So the question is, uh, is uh, so these, these sorts of um, changes that were happening were very obvious in a species such as that. Uh, naturalists were very aware that this was happening in terms of species expanding their range. But a PhD student of mine um, looked at this question and, and whether there was a general pattern of change happening within wildlife in, in Britain. So what she did is um, look across a whole range of species where we had um, data on their distributions through time. Oh, and um, so the butterfly example, the, that comma butterfly, so this is the average um, shift, northward shift at the range margin over around about a 40-year period. So looking at, in the earlier period, um, how far north the distribution range was, and then again, in the later period, how far north it was, and uh, quantifying that difference. So this shows the average for the group, and the error bars indicate the sort of variability in those response. So there's two things, or two or three things to take away from this graph, really, is that uh, butterflies weren't really that extreme in terms of showing this response. And we, we, were, we found uh, this response across a range of species groups. Um, so there's a wholesale shift in biodiversity happening within the period of climate warming. And also some of the error bars here are quite large. So there's, there's lots of variability in how far species were moving. Some species not moving at all. Some species, species moving a lot. So there's, there's a lot of variability in responses. There's been a lot of subsequent research to try and understand which species are moving and which aren't. And the, the group that weren't moving are the amphibians and reptiles, because there's relatively few species in the UK, and they've been lost from um, their uh, sort of northerly range for other reasons of land use change, which which over which over over has overridden the um, um, impacts of climate warming. 
so that was um, so that a lot of that work was quite influential in um, intergovernmental plan on climate change, um, looking at the evidence of the biological impacts of climate change, and that response has been shown in other systems across the world now as a as one of the responses to climate to climate warming. But the second example in climate change is to illustrate that perhaps uh, uh, that some of these responses to warming temperature aren't uh, linear effects. So um, gradual warming does allow these sort of range expansions, but a lot of the focus now is on the potential impact of extreme events, be that uh, extreme heat events, flooding events, or drought events, etc., and their effect on biodiversity. So using another butterfly example, this has been looked at in a bit more detail. So this is this is actually using some of the um, more detailed citizen science data from regular um, counts of butterfly numbers from um, line transects across the country. And these are also starting to be set up um, across India, where we have good information on over time as to the year on year, the numbers, um, so abundance data rather than just presence data now. So we know the butterflies fluctuate a lot year to year, but what we've seen from when we've had environmental perturbations, such as a, in our case, an extreme drought event, we see a drop in the population um, level. And by quantifying that drop, um, the literature or the way of classifying this is to sort of describe this as the sensitivity, sensitivity to an extreme event. And then typically what we see is a recovery phase over two or three years and then returning to some sort of mean, mean conditions. Um, and the second uh, part of this, uh, my colleague Tom Oliver um, looked at um, a drought event in the UK for this species uh, which, which is sort of woodland, uh, first open spaces within woodland, woodland edges, um, how it crashed in response to this drought effect, and also how that response was affected by the landscape, the type of landscape that the butterfly populations were in. And what he found was that in landscapes with um, a large amount of woodland, um, the sensitivity either drop in populations because of the drought was lower, so the, the biggest effect of the drought effects were occurring in areas without, where there was not much habitat to support butterfly species. And the second thing he looked at was found a relationship in the, you know, how quickly, so this rate of recovery to get back to your mean level, how long it took. And he found that in uh, areas with very patchy habitat, uh, i.e. not uh, very fragmented landscapes, that the rate of recovery um, was not as good. So what he did then is, is looked at this across a range of um, other butterflies and in a similar way quantified um, the rate of population collapse and the rate of recovery. And I'll come on to this in a minute. The reason he, he was interested in this is, is one of the predictions under climate change is that um, extremes will become uh, as well as average warming, there will be more extremes, there will be more frequent extreme events affecting populations. So he was interested in if they're becoming more extreme and more frequent, whether populations would have long enough to recover before the next um, drought effect hit their populations. So to do this, he, he worked with the climate scientists and focused on um, the event he was looking at was an, an uh, a 1995 drought event that happened in the UK where we saw these population crashes and calculated a measure of um, the dryness of um, the landscape based on the weather patterns um, the rainfall and the amount of uh, and the temperature from meteorological data. Um, and this figure shows the observed data in the black dots and the, the lines. So there's lots of fluctuation, but this event was at the extreme of anything that had been observed over since back to 1750 from the meteorological look. So it was in definition extreme event. And the colored lines um, indicate the, the scenarios of climate change from the, um, the 
the predictions that are coming out of the modeling work from the climatologists. So the red is the most extreme scenario of um, high level of, these are called radi radi radiative forcing, it's about the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere. Um, and they range from extreme scenarios to low scenarios. So the prediction is that this event that we observe is going to become more likely um, in future climates. And so what they did in terms of modeling this work is then applying um, understanding of how the butterflies are responding to these extreme events in terms of how sensitive they were and how they recovered um, and running that through in terms of future climate change scenarios. So what these figures show is the blue line is the, the low climate change scenario and the red is the more extreme. And on the, um, the y-axis is the, the probability that these populations are going to still persist if these extreme events become more extreme and more regular. And what he found, not surprisingly, is in more extreme scenarios, there's a high probability that these populations will go extinct in the UK landscape. They're more likely to persist in um, lower climate change scenarios. That's, that's probably quite an obvious conclusion, really. The other thing he was managed to illustrate was that he then applied different scenarios of how the land was going to be managed in terms of the amount of habitat and how connected it was, and showed that in well-connected landscapes versus very fragmented, not much habitat landscapes, you have a much better potential outcome for these for biodiversity in response to climate change. So it's, uh, I guess it's a message that the mitigation of climate impacts um, or the climate change impacts of extreme events can be mitigated by um, protection of habitats and um, connectivity of landscapes. So that was uh, the, some examples of the uh, sort of climate change stories. I'm now going to move on to a more recent work that we've provided a focus. So I guess a feature of this sort of data is that we're, we can, because it's, it's long term and large scale, we can, we can adapt it to whatever pressing question is being asked in terms of um, the scientific literature. So we've been doing some recent work on insecticide pollution um, through um, a group of chemicals called neonicotinoids that have been, uh, there's been a lot of press attention about these in, in throughout Europe because um, there's, there was a lot of attention from laboratory and small scale experiments showing that there was, a, there was potential impacts of these pesticides beyond their target audiences. Uh, the target species in terms of pest species. So they were having wider, potentially having wider environmental impacts. So people who were starting to publish evidence of impacts on birds, for example, as they accumulated up the food chain and evidence of effects on pollinating insects. So we were, we were really interested in, do these um, pesticides that are being applied quite widely in the landscape affect wild bees and therefore potentially pollination of both crops and wild plants? and whether the way that this was being exposed to, to wildlife was through these um, oilseed rape crops that are quite widely grown across Europe for um, sort of cooking oil and biofuel type reasons. Um, so just to illustrate how the, the, the rate of change in the use of these pesticides, this figure shows it, the line is the, uh, the amount of this oilseed rape crop has been grown in the last. So it's just grown. It's it's increased quite markedly in how much of it's been grown, but it's it's subject to quite a lot of pest damage through um, uh, sort of pollen beetles and other um, species that affect how productive this crop is in terms of its um, value for farmers. So as a result, this family of compounds called neonicotinoids, which are a, a sort of a nerve agent type. Um, pesticide that affects um, the pest species. And the way it de is developed is that it's, it's, it's a pesticide that's treated on the seeds of the crop. And then as the crop grows, the pesticide gets expressed throughout the plant um, through the leaves and the pollen. So it, in theory, it's a, it, it makes sense because it localizes the pesticide to the plant material, which is by, being attacked by insects. But the concern was that 
it was having wider impacts either because non-target species were feeding on pollen where this pesticide was being expressed or what's emerging now is that um, this seed when it's being planted there's, there's a lot of contamination through through seeds being blown through the landscape so the, these um, pesticide effects were going beyond the cropped environment but it was very hard to to understand how this effect would um, how this at the larger scale whether this effect would have impacts on pollinators so the way we we looked at this is that we had data on wild bee species so we were able to look at around 60 species over 18 years from a number of good cells that we knew were relatively well -related. and some statistical techniques that have been developed that are very helpful for this for this data um, and we think do a very good job of, of um, controlling for the so a feature of citizen science data is very biased in terms of where it's collected from so these models are quite effective at dealing with those um, issues and then so we had information on where the bees were occurring through time and then we compared that to um, other data on where the crop how much crop was being grown in those places and how much um, the dose of these pesticides and because it's a mix of pesticides how how um, toxic they were as a sort of mixture of chemicals um, and the, the question really is, was quite simple really was uh, are these is there evidence that these neonicotinoids are being harmful to wild bees and the secondary question is is the exposure through foraging on oilseed rape and um, the, the published paper obviously gives more detail but the, the sort of conclusion was that yes we had some quite we had good evidence of the impact of these pesticides scaling up to the wider landscape and having effects on the persistence of wild bee species um, and the sort of main one of the main figures to conclude this is that we were able to um, separately look at species that were known to forage so these wild bee species that we that were known to forage on all seed rape crops from detailed field studies versus these species that don't typically feed on the the crop um, and what we found is a much more a much stronger negative effect on those bee species that were feeding on uh, that were visiting obviously rape crop so their persistence was the persistence their persistence was lower um, with greater use with greater um, in areas where there was more application of these neonicotinoid pesticides but we also found uh, a negative effect on non-foragers. So these species aren't typically visiting the crop. But they're obviously gaining some exposure through sort of contamination, wider contamination. So as a result of this, this work and other sort of laboratory evidence, these pesticides have now been banned across Europe. So quite a, um, a direct in, a link between citizen science data collection, analysis for a particular problem, and leading to some quite major change in policy and, and major um, financial impact to the pesticide companies who are clearly not very happy about this. Um, just to summarize this, um, show the, that's the distribution of the data we used, we did actually find a positive effect of, uh, um, of all seed rape in general because of it's providing a, a lot of flowering resource for wild bees to forage on. But then on top of that, where there was being treated a lot with um, neonicotinoids, we saw a negative effect, and we couldn't pick up an effect of other pesticides. And to illustrate, we illustrated um, for individual species, bee species, this effect. So obviously, these were affected differently. But what these figures show is the, uh, the red line is, is what the models um, showed in terms of the persistence of these species. Um, the sort of observed effect or the observed time trend and the blue line is if if we took out this effect of neonicotinoids this is what the populations would have been doing in the absence of those um, inputs from the so it sort of illustrates that um, the decline was was higher because of the in, the additional impact of the neonicotinoid effects so the final sort of brief example I'm going to give is um, on biological invasions so again, this is this is a topic that when 
these schemes were set up a long time ago. No one was really, it wasn't a particular focus of, in fact, none of these issues were really a focus of um, why people were recording wildlife. They were more interested in um, identifying um, priorities for conservation in terms of red, red listing and um, um, managing land. So it's another topic where we've, we've, we've moved into um, being able to use this data for. And um, what, uh, what we see in the UK, and this is quite a common pattern for lots of regions of the world where this has been looked at, what we've been able to do is, is take an overview of all the non-native species in uh, Britain when they arrived or how many were arriving in certain periods. So what we see is a, a, a trend for an increasing amount of arrival of non-native species. So these are species that are moved around through the influence of man, either deliberately or accidentally through contamination of um, uh, plant material, et cetera, or forestry. And we're also able to classify those where there's some evidence of a negative effect on biodiversity or human human health, for example, or crops, a sort of economic or uh, social impact. And one, so these are also increasing um, in terms of the rate of arrival. So most non-natives, there's not much evidence they're actually doing much in the landscape, perhaps mainly associated with um, disturbed urban habitats. But there's a proportion which are uh, potentially quite problematic. In terms of the numbers, most non-native species in Britain are plants, often associated with uh, gardening. A fewer animals, non-natives, um, but there's quite a few in the marine and freshwater environments. But in terms of those that, where the smaller number that we, we have some evidence of an impact, the numbers switch around. So although there's many more plants, very few of them, there's much evidence of a, a strong impact. But for the when non-native animals tend to be introduced into an area, they seem to have uh, as much more evidence of an impact. So we've had several deer species that have been introduced into the UK and they've been quite damaging for forestry. There's been quite a lot of um, freshwater non-native species that have had marked impacts on other freshwater species or uh, damage uh, the banks of rivers or spread diseases to native species. So there's quite a lot of um, evidence of impact in those environments. And uh, a key part of this work is really, uh, once non-natives arrive and have established, there's very little you can do to control them. So a big focus of this work now has been around what's called horizon scanning to um, try and predict which species are going to arrive in the near future so that there can be plans to um, have eradication programs or control programs or the second element of this is to identify how species are tending to arrive and therefore um, put measures in place to reduce the potential risk of new arrivals. So there's quite good um, uh, guidance around people having uh, fish for their own ponds or uh, fish tanks. It's not, to, it's, it's not to throw them into the local river when they get bored or the local lake, etc. So this is quite good advice now. And this, I show this slide because of the, um, the author list. You won't know these people, but a lot of these people come from the citizen science community because they're the real experts on these species. They know what's here already, or in the UK or Britain already. They know what's likely to come because they're in touch with their colleagues in Europe. Um, so they're very effective at... So what this process involves is a whole group of experts coming together for their own expertise, if they're plant experts or insect experts, marine experts, freshwater experts, and come up with some agreed list of priorities. And what they did is they identified the, the top 10, the top 100 species that they thought, based on their expert opinion, were going to arrive next. And this is some of them that they identified, and they're now a priority for um, uh, control programs to potentially um, be put into place if they do arrive. But the key part of citizen science in this is that there's, there's, there's a lot of awareness raising within the biological recording community, the naturalists out there who are often the first people to find these species, is to, to know when they've seen something new and where to report it 
um, so that um, the right people know. So this, um, and actually, since they published this paper, I think within a couple of years, maybe um, three or four of the top 10 had arrived already. So they were quite successful in predicting what would arrive. And one species there, there's been a lot of attention around in the UK is a, is a wasp from, from Asia, a hornet from Asia that is in France that's predicted to arrive. Actually, I think two individuals have, a, have arrived within Britain and it's a concern because it attacks, it predates upon honeybees. So um, people who are keeping bees for honey, for example, are quite concerned about this species. And when it arrived, it was reported quite quickly and uh, was successfully eradicated. So that was um, hopefully some examples of how we have tackled some of these issues. So I just want to end by a few of my, or our sort of priorities for what we do next in this area is that we, we see great value in citizen science, although it's a recognized way of recording biodiversity in the UK, we see potential of this raising interest in this way of doing uh, monitoring in science, it can be very beneficial, um, and, ex and that includes both targeting projects and activities, a relatively expert people, um, naturalists, but also wider participation. Um, and, and then it's really us, we have the problem of dealing with the data quality, but we shouldn't let that restrict us of what we do. We have some good techniques of um, understanding the biases and dealing with, with them in the data sets. Um, many of our schemes are just very simple in terms of people telling us what they found, but we, we do also try and introduce a bit more structure where we think um, naturalists are uh, prepared to do a, a bit more in terms of what they'll contribute. Um, and an important area in this, which I had some discussions earlier with um, some people here, is about we really need to understand the motivations of people and why they take part, how to, and then how to adapt what we do so that they see benefit as well as um, benefit for us as scientists. So understanding the social side, the people side of this is, is a growing area of interest for us. Um, but this, these structured data can be very valuable. So a lot of our, um, so there's some well-established schemes for butterflies. We're trying to establish one for plants and one for pollinating insects. There's good data on birds and bats that are run in partnership with our organizations. And they provide some of our top level used by the government to assess the state of the natural environment. And what we see actually is the insects, the butterflies and the moths, they're doing much worse than um, some of the other groups um, in Britain. And I think that's, that's generally true across Europe. So getting good, good information on insects is quite important, I think, for having a realistic assessment of biodiversity. Uh, the other thing we're doing is technology has is, is already had a big impact on this area, particularly the, the internet era has made all this so much easier. But there was other technologies that are starting to be developed and having relevance to citizen science. So there's quite a lot of work on sensors that's happening in, in biodiversity terms. That's often sound sensors, so um, detecting uh, bats by sound or some insect species that um, are detectable by a sound. Um, another key thing which is starting to uh, um, people are starting to look at is uh, molecular techniques, environmental DNA, particularly to detect, for example, non-native species that are hard to detect in, in rivers, but can be can leave a signal of their DNA. Um, and this, the final sort of focus for us is, is uh, as biodiversity researchers, we're very interested in biodiversity for its own sake. We, we see um, sort of intrinsic value, uh, but Another focus is, is thinking about how is, how is biodiversity functioning in terms of providing services to humans, um, to societies, for example, for providing clean water, providing food, um, providing capture of carbon from the atmosphere, for example. So biodiversity for itself, but also for other um, ecosystem services. And to understand that we might need better information on how species interact in the environment. So that's another focus for us going forward. 
So just to give another example of where we've tried to tackle this question of um, the function provided by species, we did some work across the range of groups where we have some data, and we, we did a very simple classification as to, so ant species provide some pest control, they help with some de de um, decomposition tasks in terms of um, cycling of nutrients, as opposed to, say, mosses and liverworts, which mainly provide um, uh, probably carbon capture, carbon sequestration, they sort of take um, carbon out of the atmosphere. So a very simple classification. And what we then did is then look at how these group, groupings of by function, how these species had fared over the um, sort of 20, 30 year period from the data. And what we found is that, again, re reinforcing this, this finding that probably the insects are those that are being most affected, declining most. So therefore the services that may be most at risk are things such as pollination, some the cultural value of um, insects and birds, for example, sort of appreciation by people. But some of these other services are, are relatively um, still being provided because um, uh, particularly common species for plants may be faring reasonably well. But coming back to this point about, it's all very well us as research scientists having interest in these questions. We need to be very careful that whatever we propose in this area is um, uh, of interest to people who are providing us this data, naturalists who may not be that interested in ecosystem services are really just recording wildlife for their own benefit. So I hope you've, that's given you an overview of the sorts of things we've been doing in the UK and um, some ideas of some of the research outputs. Um, and thanks for your attention. Yeah, so there is, uh, yeah, because I, I, before coming here, I was, I was thinking that, but the, um, there is, so when I was visiting NCBS and talking to a few people, um, some of the, in, in India, some of the, a lot, some of the work on the um, building up communities and reviewing data, collecting data, is being done by some People who've recently retired, for example, who've got a bit more time and um, have a pension that they've got a bit more free time. So that's one type of citizen scientist. The, the other type of citizen scientist that we've, we've, a lot of the schemes when they were developing would maybe engage with um, people who are rangers on reserves who were in these places anyway, wanted to understand what was happening to their sites. And so would contribute data. Um, for some popular groups, people are doing it because they, they're interested in recording birds. And a, a way of that's been successful is then building those up as communities of people who, what they get out of it is going, is doing something with people they share an interest with, um, often coordinated through Facebook groups or going into the field together. And another big growth, which I think is true in India as well, is the growth in photography. People like photo photographing. So I think what I think, so I think it is challenging. I think a lot of these things can grow very slowly, but, but then they get some momentum around them and people see it as a, a thing that's in, of value. And, um, and, if, and if you can allow people to con contribute very simply, then you can grow grow your communities and so I think it's being imaginative about how you try and bring people into uh, yeah and but before starting so one of the things we did on when I started talking about the review of projects 
we also produced a guide which I think we would say think very carefully before you start something up that citizen science doesn't work for every question you want to go for and be very clear on what your question is who your audience is and and how you're going to support them because you need to give something back if you're going to ask them to do something for you so yeah I think I think we, we say be, we're cautiously enthusiastic about citizen science. We don't think it solves everything, but can be very valuable. Well, I, I have one question about your data, which your climate change data, which you know shows basically everything is moving northwards. But I just wondered, uh, there's a lot more people collecting data now than there were in, and, and I just your time frames for using those are spanning decades and decades, right? And I imagine with the modern technology, you have a lot, or maybe I'm wrong, but you have a lot more participants. Yeah. How do you know that that's not just a factor of the number of participants and just that more people are looking and therefore they find them? And do you yeah. ever see shrinkages of, uh, of, of, of ranges? Just, yes, we of do. Any yeah, so um, I, haven't, I didn't really focus on the declines, but we do see over similar periods some major declines in um, a proportion of species often to do with habitat species which are very restricted to certain habitats that we know have been lost in the landscape through conversion of grasslands to crops or because of urbanization um, yeah so we do see that a lot of those declines which is why those average declines of butterflies are going down because we are seeing declines as well and the question about we do we we ask we have seen big increases in the amount of data mainly because it's so much easier to capture data and also more people being involved so we've there there are these statistical techniques um these bayesian occupancy models that are um they they um have two parts. Then one part is to deal with the bias in terms of how the data was collected and try and correct for that. And then on top of that, they look for a relationship with the environmental change signal. So we've done a lot of data simulation work on those methods and other methods that are in the literature. And um, they perform, seem to perform very well to the sorts of bias that we know is in the system. So one bias is a clear increase in the number of rec records. We also see other biases in terms of technology allows people to record in different ways. So previously, naturalists would have gone to a place, spent a whole day and produced a list. Um, and that would be most of the data we had. But now we get somebody who's sending a record of one thing they've just seen that's of interest. And other people are still producing lists. So um, we so ultimately the problem we've got is we know when somebody's seen something because they tell us but we don't know the absences because we don't, we're not told i saw this but i didn't see that and that and that so there's we use a very a variety of techniques to work out what's absent and typically it's if you know an area has been well recorded for a group of species but there's these other species weren't there we can be confident on the absence so i think we're yeah we're we, we get question we get that question a lot when we try and publish in journals so we've got often these papers will have a, a lot of supplementary material arguing and demonstrating through analysis why we don't think that's an issue so we obviously think we deal with it pro appropriately but it is a, a big concern yeah you have a question yeah. Uh, so, uh, citizen science seems to be such interesting uh, democratic investment, which is kind of yielding a lot of scientific knowledge. And uh, so, for me, the operative word is democratic. So, uh, so you have a lot of these big citizen science networks in the United Kingdom. And I just want to know what your feelings are about how is citizenry defined in these activities, right? Because 
Yeah, no, I think, I'm not sure it's been looked at that um, systematically, but it would, be a, it would be a biased set of people in the UK. Um, probably, I, well, my own personal view is we get a lot of people who are newly retired, so they've got more time on their hands, and maybe they started off with an interest as children in, in insects and wildlife, and then got busy with jobs and families, and, uh, and then come back and find um, like-minded people that they can form a community. And we're also getting a lot of young people who are getting involved, who are, I think, are probably motivated by concern about the environment. They want to get involved in um, being more knowledgeable, but also hopefully being part of the solution of um, identifying what's happening to the environment. So we've, we've certainly got those two, because often it's, there's, we often hear the concern that a lot of the people participating are getting older and older and older and we'll lose everybody. But we do, we are getting a lot of younger generation who do everything through Facebook and do things a very different way. So, but I think in terms of, I think there have been specific projects which have tried and tried to involve a wider set of communities, say urban deprived areas. And that, that's still a challenge, I think, because of issues to do with education, access to resources, be that internet access or financial resources to travel. So yeah, I think that is an issue. And I think one of the themes in citizen science now is, is that social dimension, both why people contribute and understand the sorts of projects that are gonna work, but also the demographics of who's contributing and whether it's really delivering what I think should be a good aim of these projects is is wider awareness of environmental issues by reaching all, all parts of communities. But I, we, I don't think we've got a good, we haven't got good quanti quantitative data on that yet. And I think we, we, and we probably won't have e easy solutions about how to solve it, but I think it's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. I just had another observation. So I'm really impressed. It's fascinating when I saw the number. You said about UK has about 1,400 and some 90 introduced species, right? Because we have we grown up reading and listening to folks telling us that most of the Britain, Britain introduced so much species in its colonies. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really interesting. There was a 2003 report or something by the University of Environment and Sciences. They, they kind of identified forty percent of species in India to have been introduced, right? Wow. I was pretty really fascinated by that number you put out there. I was wondering how much of that came from India. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of it comes through you know, the reason species are moving around now is because there's so much more trade going on and everywhere's much more connected. Uh, in the in that paper they they will break down where these things have come from as we believe, whether it's it may not be as specific as India. It might be the um, Asia or Southeast Asia or um, Southwest Asia or whatever. But um, yeah, I, yeah, I'm very conscious that when when British people went around with the world, they wanted to have their familiar species. So a lot of the New Zealand and Australia invasive species have come from deliberate planting or bringing of species across the world. So yeah. <laughs> We're getting our own back now. And if you see someone's really interested, is that an attempt to, you know, educate them further? Probably is is that also part of the entire exercise? Yeah, so the so as uh, the way we we do this is we work through these these other organisations who um, they're typically independent interest groups or charities. So maybe interested in moths or um, bryophyte mosses. So they would tend to give the feedback and hold meetings to bring people together, provide newsletters, um, 
and sort of websites to give back. But I think that's an important part of successful citizen science is to give some feedback of results. Because the projects haven't worked very well is if they're, they're very good at collecting, but they never give any results back or involve people in the project. So yeah, there's a lot of that in lots of different ways. And it's a very important part of the um, being effective, I think. How do you authenticate the presence of uh, ants and spiders if it's like entered on your app or like other than geotagging, what's the other thing? Like, authentication of the presence. Yeah, so we um, we take we use a variety of ways of um, having some understanding of the quality. So uh, one way is if for species where it's possible for t photographic evidence is obviously quite important. Um, otherwise, we have some computer techniques which try and assess the likelihood of an observation. So if, if it's in an unusual place or uh, um, an unusual time of the year or unusual habitat, we'll, we'll flag it up as scrutiny. And then we have systems which allow experts to have ask the, the contributor um, for some detail if they want. We also um, produce, um, so for the experts who review, so we have experts who review this data, um, again, doing it voluntarily, and they'll, they'll, they'll also be provided with a, a summary of what that person has contributed before. So if the, con the, if the person has contributed lots of ant records before and they've all been accepted, then it's more likely that um, they'll be accepted and more scrutiny will be given to unusual species, unusual records. So we accept that there'll be errors in this data, that, that no data set is perfect. So we, we do as much as we can to review data and make sure it's um, accepted quality, but uh, it will only prove useful if it, if it then relates to um, if we can explain the patterns we see or the change we see, but um, we hope the models are robust enough to deal with some variability in the quality. Because I think it's impossible to have every piece of data right, but yeah, it is an important thing to, to put some effort into. I have a quick question. Um, I work mostly in the urban, so I wanted to know the split of your citizen science across urban and non-urban areas. And I just wanted to kind of visualize it spatially. So do you have teams who are mostly city-based and then they go out and conduct this? If you could just yeah. on that. So because it involves people, most if you look at the number of records where they're coming from across the country, we, it will be strongly associated with urban areas. So actually, citizen science. Some of the some of the more so this is quite a general way of doing citizen science. Some of the more targeted citizen science have been very successful in urban areas because you've got more people to contribute. So, but so yeah, we we have more people in urban areas or the surrounding areas. But then we also get people who will deliberately travel to record different species um, and. Uh, the thing about the UK is it's reasonably densely populated anyway. So, but we do we do to get um, lots of data from areas in Scotland which are more remote or less people live in. So we have to take account of gaps in those areas when we do some analysis. Yeah, I think, uh, citizen science in urban areas is quite a good option. I think. So I'm an intern here, and um, I'm still a college student. So I was wondering how many college students you have in the UK who are part of your citizen science teams, because from our college, we uh, did something we called the biodiversity mapping of the area we live in, because we live in a relatively remote area with, with, with in a new university. So I was wondering how many college students you have who work yeah. on this. 
uh, it's interesting. I was speaking to um, someone earlier about this and how successful it had been in uh, one of the universities in India. And uh, we have some universities who actively promote this, but I don't think we know. We wouldn't know. I don't think um, based on to register on our systems it's just an email address and we don't cap much more information about people but it could be it's quite an interesting way of trying to get people involved in citizen science um, because uh, yeah there's universities all over the country and there maybe have the interest and the time to get involved but yeah no I don't think we know but I think it's a good idea to um, try and promote projects that way Any more questions? No? Okay. Th thank you, David. Yeah, thank you. That's great set of questions. Thank you.